Hey everybody, Bert here. This past Sunday, we kicked off a new teaching series, a little three-week mini-series in John chapter 15. Now, before we get into John chapter 15, I just wanna walk through a little bit of the why. Why are we spending these three weeks in January unpacking John 15 together? Well, one of the reasons is uh, we're kind of already in the narrative in John, and so we wanted to just mine every little bit of gold we could from the book of John. But the overarching reason is as we are preparing to get into, um, we've been using this language around rebuilding of honestly just reassessing where we are at, hitting the reset button and being able to move forward with clear vision and direction into the season ahead. One of the first things we wanted to do is actually make sure before we're putting our hand to anything tangible, before we're talking about all these grand ideas of mission and vision and all of that good stuff, we wanted to actually root ourselves deeply in Christ. Now that may sound like a no-brainer thing, but but I want you to think about how often we go about life without actually spending time to commune with Christ or to use Jesus's language in John to abide with him. And so we wanted to put our flag there at the beginning of the year saying the first and most important thing we can do is actually bring our attention to Christ and our relationship with him. Now why John 15? John 15 is a bit of a manifesto for how we relate to God and how God relates to us. So if you're in a spot where you could read your Bible along with me, please do that. If not, you can listen along as I read John chapter 15, starting in verse 1, and we'll actually go all the way to verse 17. Even though our prime teaching text is going to be in those first 11 verses, we'll get the whole thing for some context. Jesus, with his disciples, says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. And you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another." Jesus, as we take just some moments to saturate ourselves with what you have to say about how we relate to you and each other, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be with us, illuminating the text, bringing challenge, conviction, encouragement, joy, fruitfulness, but ultimately, we pray that it would lead us to you and a more abundant, fruitful relationship with you. We pray this in the name of you, Jesus, our Savior, the one who says, we can have relationship with the divine. Amen. The famous author, theologian, philosopher G.K. Chesterton said this, quote, The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. End quote. I wonder if just reading through John 15 and sharing that quote we might just be able to pack up and be done for the day and just sit in those realities. I don't know about you, but when I read through John chapter 15, I'm both overwhelmed by the access we have with God, and I also feel like this doesn't really represent my life as often as I would like it to. 
maybe I'm not alone in that. And I think of that quote from Chesterton that said the Christian ideal, which is John 15 in one sense, has not been tried and found wanting, meaning it's not actually been pursued and found that it lacks anything. It's been found difficult or vague or complicated or oversimplistic or we've been distracted or we're too busy or we don't actually stop and take time to do the things that Jesus is laying out for us. And it's been left untried. Today, we start in on this three-week series in John chapter 15, and we titled the series Christian Mystics, the Ancient Art of Abiding with God. And so I shared with you guys on Sunday, um, if you've not yet read With, Reimagining the Way You Relate to God by author Sky Jeffani, highly, highly recommend. It's been super helpful as we've been kind of preparing this uh, three-week teaching series, uh, and it will just give you so much more than we can unpack here, and will help honestly give some breadth and depth to some of the ideas and topics that we're going to be talking about over the next three weeks. Now, the relationship that Jesus invites us into in John chapter 15 is the foundation of our understanding of how we relate to God. Jesus here is giving a bit of a roadmap, the how to, the what to expect of life with God. And what you'll notice here is it's not filled with a lot of to-dos or not filled like a lot of things that you need to accomplish but it's filled with a lot of just simply being or abiding. And that word translated could also mean to make your home with. It's filled with a lot of that kind of language, which I don't know about you, sometimes makes me a little uncomfortable because it runs so counter to how I'm wired as a person. It's really clearly presented in John chapter 15, what God hopes and wants for us, even though it feels foreign, mystical, or elusive. We don't fully understand what Jesus is saying here, so often we tend to default to a different way of relating with God. And that's the essence of the first few chapters of Jethani's book, With, is he really unpacks these ways we get our relationship with God wrong. Because we read something like John chapter 15, and maybe stay away from it because it is elusive, it's vague, it's hard, it seems like written for another time and doesn't apply to us anymore or just a bit too mystical and spiritual. So we default to some other postures. Rather, our, our default posture is not with God, we swap in other ways of relating with God. And ultimately, each one of those ways are insufficient. And in with, Jethani shares four ways, four postures that we get our relationship with God wrong. And I actually think they're worth naming as a bit of an introduction to this series because it's helpful, in as much as it's helpful to know what we're trying to go for, it's also helpful to name some of the things that we're not going for in our relationship with God. So four postures and how we get our relationship with God wrong. First posture is life under God. Life under God. And the life under God posture sees God in simple cause and effect terms. So we obey his commands and then he blesses our lives, he blesses our families, he blesses our nation. Some people operate with this mentality that if we just get the formula right, God blesses us. And we, if we get the formula wrong, God curses us. And so many people will look at the state of our country today and said, we have gotten part of the formula wrong, thus God is cursing us. The posture of life under God says that through adherence to religious rules, rights, and ideas, I can open up the favor of God in my life. Now, why is this wrong? Why is this not a correct way of relating to God? Well, one, it views God as moralistic, stating that his goal for you is to just follow his rules, and if you do, you get rewarded. If you don't, you get punished. So Jesus, in his interactions with the Pharisees and the religious elites, actually reveals the bankruptcy of this kind of posture. It doesn't rescue us from fear, guilt, shame, or it actually heaps on those things and just with a healthy dose of empty religiosity in the mix. And we see Jesus... um, Uh, quoting from the the prophet Isaiah in one of his interactions with the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 15, verses 7, 8, and 9, where he says to the religious elite, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, quote, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. 
Now, how does somebody land here? Because after reading that scathing rebuke from Jesus, you're like, oh, I don't, I don't want this. I don't want that to, re, to be a, a reflection or a mirror of my life. But how does somebody land here? Well, the Bible does talk a lot about obedience. It talks a lot about reward, and it talks a lot about discipline and punishment. Those ideas are alive and well in Scripture. Anyone who says they are not are sorely misreading or just avoiding parts of the Bible. But without understanding the kind of relationship God actually wants to have with us, one could easily misread the scriptures and land in this life under God posture and says our relationship with him is predicated on these rules and regulations. It often comes when someone is around Christianity, but not necessarily engaged in a relationship with Jesus themselves. So maybe they're exposed to a lot of Christian movies, Christian TV shows, Christian books, Christian memes, Christian school, Christian upbringing, whatever, but maybe have never actually had this this authentic uh, faith journey themselves and they've just inherited culture from around them. It's what we'd say like cultural Christianity, right? And so this is how someone might end up in this posture. So one way we get our relationship with God a bit wrong. The second posture is this life over God posture. So, you know, kind of an opposite. So rather than living under the oppression of moralism and rules and regulation, they kind of philosophically, intellectually, or just with their life, live as though God is not actively engaged or present or even matters. So in the life over God posture, the mystery and wonder of the world is lost as God is abandoned in favor of proven formulas and controllable outcomes. This posture is one that through practice or actual belief says that God has no bearing on the everyday stuff of life and our personhood. And in a sense, it's saying that we make our own destiny. We create our own path through human effort. We can accomplish the things that we set out to do without divine intervention or help. Now, this would on one hand be the default posture of an atheist, for instance, but it would also be the posture here that's included inside the church because even those who express belief in Jesus often live as though he has no bearing on their life, their work, their accomplishments, their budgets, their families, their calendar, their time, their decision making. And it doesn't, none of those things actually reflect God's involvement. They're all incredibly still self centered and self gratifying. The Christian version of life over God reduces God to sort of this cosmic watchmaker who just sort of like sets all the pieces in motion and then steps away. Otherwise known as Christian deism, right? Christian deism. And this view often leads to life without God altogether because if you don't need God in the everyday stuff of life, why do you need God at all? Now, this is wrong. This posture is wrong because it views God as distant and uninterested in anything more than the initial creation of this world. And then he just pieces out. And that's not at all the way the Bible describes God. God is quite actively involved in the not only macro events of human history, but also with you and me individually, intimately. And this view of God also sort of repeats the sin motif of Eden, taking hold of good and evil and deciding what that is for ourselves. Now, how does somebody land here? Now, apart from those who just outright reject a belief or a relationship with God altogether, how might a Christian land here is some people view being in a relationship with an unseen God just too untenable. It's too mysterious, it's too unknown, thus it's impossible. Because remember, I think, therefore I am. And so if we cannot comprehend a relationship with an unseen God, it must not be possible altogether. People who find themselves in this posture may find prayer difficult. Worship doesn't feel super close. It's just sort of a performance with songs. And it is easier to take steps in living a good life, even one described by God in the Bible, than it is to relate to God himself. So over time, For a Christian who finds themselves in this space, the idea of God is just reduced to a source of good wisdom and life is lived without relationship with God altogether. Two postures, life under, life over God, and ways we get our posture with him wrong. Now, the third posture is a life from God. People in the life from God category want God's blessings and gifts, but they are not particularly interested in God himself. So the life from God posture reflects a person whose primary connection to God is the answer to questions like, what can God do for me? Or maybe a different version of that question is, how can God make my life 
better. And if that is the primary expression of how you relate to God, of asking him for things, expecting you to make you happy, healthy, wealthy, then we are missing something. This treats God as sort of a cosmic vending machine. We just choose the right things we want him to give us, and that's the end. This is the the roots and the default posture of the prosperity gospel. Those who would say God's purpose in your life is to make you happy, healthy, and wealthy. And the goal in life here is is, is to get the good things that God wants to give us. But the relationship we have with God is only about figuring out what we need in order to get those good things and unlock God's blessing in our life. And the sad reality is the central figure in the life from God posture is not God, but me. It's me. In this posture, God's will, his purposes, his plans, his principles, his actions are all structured around how God will make my life better. Now, why is this wrong? Now, this posture fundamentally reads scripture with me at the center instead of God at the center. And when we miss God at the center of the story, we miss him altogether. Right? It's the epitome of consumerism. And unfortunately and sadly, this translates so often in how we think about the church, God's expression here on earth, his physical manifestation here on earth. The church, the continuation of Jesus' mission to seek and save the lost and to go about advancing his kingdom. We also think about the church in consumeristic terms. What can this church do for me? How can this church provide for me? How can this church make me happy? How can it make me healthy? How can it make me wealthy? I don't know. How can this particular church satisfy my pleasures and cravings right now? Now, how does somebody land in this space? Well, the world around us is driving us to this viewpoint. So without any check from scripture or the spirit, this is where most people end up, honestly, because this is what the world around us is telling us. And it so affirms our fleshly desires that it's just the perfect mix. But Through the counterformation of the spirit through the scriptures, this doesn't have to be the natural outcome. God exists, but not just to make your life better and not just to give you uh, the way towards success. That's three postures. Life under God, life over God, life for God, and then the other kind of opposite here, life for God. The life for God posture believes the most significant life is one expended in accomplishing the great things in God's service. Right? The life for God posture is the one that can probably be most easily uh, mistaken for genuine, especially in the Christian world. Maybe this one in the life under God can be sort of regular de facto postures in a Christian community. This one here, because it produces a lot of work for the kingdom. So life under God may just be sin avoidance. This here is like taking ground for the kingdom of God. The life for God posture essentially believes that the goal of the Christian life is not found in experiencing God's love, but accomplishing tasks for him. So this may particularly appeal to those who are like church planters, missionaries, or just are like maybe those Enneagram one, three, and eights. They just want to like go out there and achieve and take ground. It also may appeal to people who are just incredibly task oriented and love just checking things off a list. This is so much more quantifiable than what we see in John chapter 15. Our place in the church and in God's favor are based on our service to him according to this posture. So our giving, our missionary or evangelistic work, and the level of sacrifice involved in these things we do for God is all part of how God sees us and how we see God. Now, why is this wrong? Well, much of the Bible is spent calling us to be a part of God's big mission, The fundamental miss of this life for God posture is found when we transpose it with the proper posture of life with God. So instead of like like fruitfulness or advancing the kingdom being an outflow of our relationship with God, which is what we see here in John 15, it's swapped. And then we do things for God in hopes that he will like us, love us, or want to be with us. So this posture says we're not as valuable to God as our accomplishments are to the kingdom. So this is quite a bit more doing over being. Now, how does somebody land here? Well, a bunch of us are task-oriented people, or some of us are just like high achievers, go-getters. And it's built, these relationships are built on sort of a give and take. How can you help me fulfill my thing and accomplish my thing? And we apply those same aspects of our personality to God. 
And then we read something like the parables of the talents. And we see Paul's reference to being a bondservant of Christ. And we put all these pieces together and come up with just life is just this nonstop drudgery of doing things for God until we die. And then maybe heaven will be a little bit better. And this is one that is actually quite easy to land on. And it's often one that's amplified by churches. It's amplified by pastors like myself who want to accomplish big things for the kingdom. So growing the church, expanding reach, sending saints, planting new churches, caring for the poor, like all these good and noble aspects of church life has this side effect when it becomes primary, that it teaches people that if we aren't doing those things, God is not pleased with us and he doesn't love us. So we work harder to achieve God's approval for us or love for us. So four postures. Life under God sees the world is governed by the capricious will of God, and we're just subjugated to that. Life over God places the immutable natural laws at the center, and God is just sort of stepped away and not really involved. Life from God assumes that the world orbits around myself and my own desires, and God is one of those things that orbits myself and my desires. And a life for God sees divine mission at the core of all things and not God's love at the core of all things. Now, before we move on, because these are all quite negative and maybe like we can obviously see there's not good ways of relating to God. But before we move too far past to see what the kind of life Jesus is calling us into, I think there are three things we need to grapple with. First thing, most, if not all of these postures come from some attempt from Satan, the flesh and the world around us to skew our understanding of how humanity is designed to relate to God and how God intends to relate to humanity. So both the flesh, the world, and the enemy are all conspiring to form us not into the image of Christ, but into something or someone else. And so each one of these postures, even though they might have a good aspect to them, or they might have some truth to them, they are footholds for the world, the flesh, and the enemy to take us off this goal of becoming more like Jesus. Number two is that we have all fallen into the trap of many, if not all of these postures in our lifetimes of following Jesus. So different aspects and different points in our journey with Jesus, we have fallen into one or probably all of these traps. I know I have. And it's not, I'm not talking like way in the past kind of thing. It's like, uh, like, uh, disappointingly (laughs) and embarrassingly recent that I have fallen into many, if not all of these postures. And sometimes at the same time, as counterintuitive as that sounds. The third thing we need to grapple with is that much of our sanctification, growth, maturity, self-improvement, whatever you want to call it, and even um, much of the, the instruction from institutions like the church has been focused on moving us from one posture, one of these four postures, to another one of these four postures. So I don't really have a graphic here, but imagine like a square quadrant right? And we have uh, life under God and life over God on the top and life uh, from God and life for God on the bottom. And so instead of moving us to a vision of John chapter 15, pastors, leaders, missionaries, speakers, churches, other institutions, families, friends, schools, even our internal self have been focused on like, okay, well, I'm just going to move from life over God to life under God, right? And so I'm over him and intellect or belief. So I'm just going to like move to under him and, and just obey his commands and hope he'll bless me. Or we might move from, you know, like a life from God consumerism to a life for God of activism and think we finally fixed what's wrong with us. And this is often what a lot of the churches are trying to do, convince you that you're a sinner in need of grace. You're not, you know, too above sin or whatever, or that you need to like reject the consumerism of our day and become active participants. Now, both of those have some truth to them, but they do not honestly lead us to the kind of life that Jesus actually spells out for us in John 15, which is our fifth posture. Obviously, it's the good one. It's life with God. This is the primary way that God is relating to us, and it's the way he wants us to relate to him. So looking at John 15 and honestly a myriad of other passages, we see that God's ultimate desire is that we would be with him. That's John 1:14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's John 3, 16. Jesus wanted to be with us. God wanted to be with us, that he would be our God and we would be his people, that his presence would be with us and we would be with his presence. There's a key moment in history 
that's referred to as the Copernican Revolution. That's a hard word to say. Copernican Revolution. It's the moment in history, led by Copernicus, obviously, when humanity realized that the universe did not revolve around the Earth, rather the Earth and the rest of what we could see in the galaxy, and we know to be, you know, much larger than that now, revolved around the sun. Right? It was the fundamental discovery that we are not the center of the universe. And it had a massive implication and sent humanity in different directions in terms of our understanding of our place in history. A similar shift in thinking must happen in the life of someone who follows Jesus in order for us to experience life the way God intended it to be experienced. The treasure is God himself, not what we can get from God. The goal is God himself. Being with God and God being with us is the objective of the human soul. We often say the best part about following Jesus is Jesus, that we get him, not the stuff we can get from him, not how we can fix our life, not how we can do things for him, but we get him. Reorienting our worldview around Jesus being, to use language of one of his parables, the pearl of great price, that causes us to forego and forsake and bail on everything else in order to have him, that realization leads us to the fullness of the abiding life. And this is it. This is our North Star, is just simply being with him. And this is right here, why. This is why we started our year here. This is the most important thing we can be doing with our time and our attention. Life with God, the abiding life, the flourishing life, the thriving life. This is what we're gonna focus our attention on in the month of January. So I hope you walk out of this month with a solid foundation of understanding life with God and know how to live that out. We see the overarching goal of the scriptures is this goal right here. The psalmist in Psalm 27 says, one thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to acquire in his temple. And then Jesus with that parable in Matthew 13 says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding the pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Jesus says something in John chapter 14 and repeats the idea in John chapter 15 that reveals this kind of life that God has for us if we are open to it. John 14, 20 says, In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. And again in John chapter 15, verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus is teaching us that life with God unites us with God himself. Paul says in Colossians 3, you have died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So, take a breather, because what we're about to do next is going to be fundamental Uh, to our understanding how we actually play this out and how this is possible. This is the theological reality of union with Christ. It will become foundational for everything you think, say, and do from the point of your salvation onward. So it's worth the investment. How you view union with Christ will dictate how you live, the decisions you make, and the kind of relationship you will have with God and the kind of life you have here on this planet in your lifetime. And union with Christ, the theology of union with Christ is kind of two ideas mashed into one. The first idea, and I know this is not grammatically correct, but roll with me here. The first idea is us in Christ. Now, if you notice, the Bible rarely uses the word Christian to describe followers of Jesus, right? We'll see kind of two other primary ideas. When the the word Christian is used, it's usually refer to like other people kind of calling you know, Christians, a certain name or moniker, but actually the way the biblical writers would describe followers of Jesus are either disciples, which means like students or apprentices, or Paul will often use this descriptor, if anyone is in Christ. The essence of Christianity is that the reality that a person is now united with Jesus. Some of the key passages Paul writes to help us understand this are Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. Romans 6.4, We were buried, therefore, with him 
Colossians 3, if you've been raised with Christ. Ephesians 2, 6, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Romans 6, 5, if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. According to Paul, and there's so many more verses we could look to, according to Paul, the nature of our salvation has united us to Christ. And the actions that Jesus performed have been applied to us, credited to us. The Bible uses the phrase in Christ to describe this unbelievable phenomenon that believers in Jesus are now credited with his righteousness. So when the father looks to you, he doesn't see your past, your sinfulness, all the ways you don't live up to the kind of life that maybe you should be living up to or whatever. He sees Jesus and his perfect life and his righteousness. So we are in Christ, hidden in him, having his righteousness applied to us. His actions applied to us. Everything about our lives is now defined by being in Christ. Now, that's the first aspect of union with Christ. The second aspect is Christ in us. So we're in Christ and Christ is in us. Colossians 1, 27. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Jesus, simply as he's commissioning his disciples in Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always to the end of the age. The entirety of John chapter 14 is Jesus describing how the Holy Spirit will be with us. Christ is in us. By his spirit, the very presence of Jesus is in us and with us. He helps us. He guides us. He empowers us. He speaks to us. He speaks through us. He refines our character and strengthens his church through us. This is all summed up in John chapter 15 when Jesus simply says, abide in me and I will abide in you. The idea of mutuality of union with Christ is that we are in Christ receiving all the benefits of his amazing righteousness and at the same time Christ is in us, his presence to change the world. Now, if you want to do a bit more here with this idea of union with Christ, there's a fantastic book I read last year called Union with Christ by Presbyterian minister Rankin Wilborn. It is absolutely fantastic. It's a little dense, so if you want to do like the deep dive into this idea of union with Christ, highly, highly recommend. Now, I know that was a lot. I know it was a bit of a fire hose to the mouth. So I want you to take another deep breath here. Deep breath. How does all of this make you feel? Pay attention to your body, your mind, your emotions. Is this exciting? Is this maybe giving language to what Paul would say is a groaning in your soul? Is this um, scary? Is it unusual? Does it feel too mystical? Does it feel too simple? How does this make you feel? And moreover, if all of this is true, how might that change how we live? If all of this, the reality that we are in Christ and Christ is in us, the default posture God has towards us and wants us to have towards him is to just be with him, not to get things from him or work for him, not to move past him and not bother him with our stuff and also not to live under the crushing moralism. But he just wants to be with you, to dwell with you, to make your home with you. And he invites you to do the same with him If this is true, how does this change how we live? How might it change our daily rhythms and habits? How might it change how we think about the church? How might it change how we think about our friends who have not yet met Jesus? How does this change how we think about all the things we need to do for God or all the things we need to get from God? This life with God posture is predicated on the view that relationship is at the core of the cosmos. God the Father, with God the Son, with God the Holy Spirit. And so we should not be surprised to discover that when God desired to restore his broken relationship with people, he sent his Son to be with us, to dwell with us, to make his home with us. His plan to restore creation was not to send a list of rules and rituals to follow, life under God, nor it was the implementation of useful principles, life over God. He did not send a genie to grant us our desires, life from God, nor did he give us a task to accomplish, life for God. And although we can look back and say God does give us a way to live, a right way and a wrong way, 
there are rules, guidelines, there are ways to like embrace Jesus's way. There are wisdom and useful principles in scripture. There are things, Jesus wants us to see our father, the giver of good gifts. There are things we can go to God and ask him for. And he most certainly gives us things to accomplish, but none of those are the primary way we, are relating, we relate to God. And God models to us the way he would hope we can relate to him. God came to be with us, to walk with us once again as he had done in the Garden of Eden in the very beginning. Jesus entered into our dark existence to share our broken world and to illuminate a different way forward. His coming was a, to quote Jethani in his book with, a sudden and glorious catastrophe of good. Here's the truth. This is the life we've always wanted, right? It's certainly the life we are made for. And if maybe if you look deeply and consider deeply all the things we've tried to cram into our life to make it better, this is the life we've always wanted a life fully satisfied in the person of Jesus, who's fully satisfied in us. We've spent so much time trying to cram other things in there, or we miss it all together and think that God is looking for something different from us, that we've convinced ourselves this posture is not enough. So as you are checking your emotions, as you are checking through the things you are thinking and feeling, as we read through and taught through some of these ideas here in John chapter 15, is one of those things that came up in your mind is, this can't be it. There has to be more. And here's the truth. Jesus is enough. He is plenty. He is our treasure, and we get to be with him. And my invitation to you is from the pearl of great price parable in Matthew 13. My invitation is for you to experience one pearl of great value, such great value that you, like the merchant in the parable, would go and sell all that you have. Bail on everything else. Stop looking to all these other people, things, places to put your hope and your satisfaction and your purpose and your worth in and to put all those things in Jesus. Jesus is the treasure and we get to be with him. So as we think about the art and the theology of the abiding life, it can be summed up as very simply as Jesus is the treasure. We get him and the theological reality that we're his treasure and that he has done everything that is needed to be done to get us, purchase us with his blood, reconciled us, brought us into our family, models for us the relationship he would hope we would have with him. So before I pray, kind of pray a blessing over you guys, I do want to land in a very practical space and give you um, some invitations to actually experiment and to try some of this stuff out because this can feel a little ethereal and abstract and so we want to root it in the everyday stuff of life. And so I have two invitations for you, two practices to try out this week. One is to simply read John 15 daily. That's it. It You can read it out loud. You can read it with your kids, with your spouse. You can start your day with it, end your day with it. You can have it, you know, get a Bible app and have it read to you. Whatever works. Let's not get legalistic here. Just spend some time in John 15, at least once a day this week, and just see what happens. And uh, the second invitation is a prayer of invitation. And that's just a fancy way of saying, start your day asking Jesus to be with you. Or maybe more theologically accurate, recognizing that he is with you and and helping you see where he's working in your life. And that could be a five second as you wake up saying, Jesus, I know you are with me. Show me how you're with me. It could be Jesus, I wanna invite you into my day. Help me be attentive to you throughout the day. It could be anything like that. It could be much longer if you want. You could tie these two things together, read John 15 and then pray a prayer of invitation. But those are the two practices I want to invite you into. John 15 daily and a prayer of invitation to start your day. And as with all of our practices that we talk about, just pay attention, see what happens. If you're a journaler, this is a great time to to activate that gift. If you're not, maybe ask someone near you uh, to ask you some kind of reflection questions or just simply pay attention to your own soul, your own body, your own mind as you engage in John 15 daily and start your day with a prayer of invitation and just see what happens.
It's amazing how God shows up when we make space for him to show up. So let me pray for you. Jesus, to those in our church community who are watching and to anyone who may stumble across this video or this podcast, I pray first and foremost that they would see you, um, that they would actually be, uh, like their eyes would be lifted uh, to see you and your desire to be with them. I pray um, that you would help us strip away distractions and busyness Um, that eliminates space to simply just be with you and to hear from you. I pray that in this season, as we're starting our year in John 15, it would also be marked by a bit of a slowdown in our pace in life so that we can recognize how you are already with us and we can join you in those spaces. So Holy Spirit, I pray for boldness, for courage. Uh, I pray uh, that these times would be sweet times of communion with you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Anthem, love you. Uh, We'll see you next Sunday as we continue through the next piece of John chapter 15. Enjoy the time in your house churches this week. Bye, guys.